Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Paul Ganchert from Ganchert Nursery and Landscapes. Uh, we've been servicing the Madison area for almost 70 years. Uh, we're a design build firm with a nursery, um, and welcome to the Garden Expo. So uh, hopefully you'll get something out of this talk for the straight and narrows uh, of plant material. Uh, you're going to hear a lot of uh, familiar names of plants you probably know, uh, except for the cultivars uh, that are connected to that. So basically, they'll take a normal uh, plant, an amylanch or whatever, uh, create a cultivar, so it's basically a mutation or a specific thing they're looking for. What we're gonna be talking about today mostly are uh, these mutations or specific points where the plant is quite a bit more narrow uh, than the species. Uh, we kind of have to divide uh, narrow as well, because that's relative. Uh, so on the one hand, uh, you look at a shade tree that might be 70 feet wide or more. Uh, maybe we have a cultivar that gets 40 feet, and that's narrow. So just so you understand what narrow is, narrow is different to everybody. Kind of like uh, age, whenever I ask if there's anybody old in the audience, they have to raise their hand once, and then they kind of wait and think, and we, we have a conversation about what is old and all that kind of stuff. So uh, anyway... Uh, we'll get rolling here. So you all have the, um, the list there of the shade trees. Uh, we'll start with them. Uh, and we start with a great one, uh, well, in shortly here. Uh, the, uh, this was just a slide uh, kind of indicative of wrong plant, wrong, plant, wrong spot. Uh, the funny thing I like about this one, so it's been trimmed to within an inch of its life. And actually, in this site, instead of removing the plant material because the screen was so important, uh, or trimming it back, which you couldn't take it back any further than it is already because uh, it would just be bare. Uh, so what did they do in their infinite wisdom? They added 18 inches of sidewalk. So there you go. There's another solution. Uh, so a lot of times with the tall and narrow, what we're talking about is screening. Uh, maybe you have a neighbor like this. Hopefully not. Um, we're trying to block out views and that kind of stuff. Maybe there's privacy. Maybe we're trying to divide a space into smaller, a couple of smaller spaces so you have a private space in your own yard. Uh, obviously, wind and snow control is an issue sometimes, and, and noise reduction. Um, the, the thing that most people start with is they say, well, I have a limited space, so I'll just put up a fence. And the reality is with that is there's codes with fences all over Wisconsin. Uh, typically, in your backyard, you're not going to be able to put a fence higher than six feet. That's a limit. Uh, in some neighborhoods, you can have no fence. Uh, typically in the side yard, front yard, you're going to have a fence of three or four feet high will be the maximum you can have, if you can have it at all. So uh, the conversations I get into clients sometimes is I become the fence. I'm six foot. So we'll be standing on an area, like I had a woman once, she had a, um, a backyard where you came out of a stoop fairly high. She was about three feet off the ground. She said, I want to build a deck here. And she had a solid six foot fence around her yard. And I said, well, I'm taking a wild guess that your privacy is an issue and it's important to you. And she said, absolutely. I said, do you have a ladder? And she said, sure, no problem. What's that for? I said, could you just step up onto this ladder up to this rung? Because that's going to be the level of your deck. And she said, okay. And I said, now look to your right. What do you see? I, well, I see all my neighbor's junk. What do you see in back? I see my neighbor's car. What do you see to the left? So you get the picture. I said, well, here's what we're going to do. Instead of building a deck, we're going to get you down as quick as we can, put a patio ad grade, and now that fence actually does something as a six-foot fence. But structurally, we're limited to about six feet. There's a couple instances where we can kind of mess around with the law a little bit, but, uh, and I'll talk to you about those later. But uh, once we get over six feet, then typically we're going to vegetation, that we can screen stuff out with vegetation. Again, sometimes we're limited with space. If you have a small yard or you have a small space between a sidewalk and a property line or whatever, uh, we're trying to address that. Um, it's, it's a challenge, um, but uh, there definitely are some things that will, will fit the bill. Uh, sometimes people look at it as noise reduction. Uh, so I can put in an evergreen hedge, uh, and the day after I put it in, you're going to say, wow, Paul, it's so much quieter. And I'm going to say, you know what? You're so wrong. If I have a decibel meter and I, st I do it the day before and the day after, that work's been done, there's virtually no difference. The only way you can stop sound is a solid surface where it's going to bounce off. But there is a high however here, a caveat. The reality is that if you don't see something, you don't hear it as much. You don't notice it as much. So if we can hide the visual, a lot of time the sound at least goes down, if not disappears. So that's just something to think about with that. Um, so anyway, we'll, we'll get into uh, some of the plants here. Like I said, the trees, uh, we're going to start with amelanchor, great plant, uh, grows really well here. Um, there's a couple of varieties here, grandiflora, uh, robin hill, 
the rainbow pillar is another one, and ovation. Uh, they're going to all be a little bit narrower than the species. Um, the biggest thing with amyl anchor is that uh, if you've never eaten the amyl anchor, you've got to go do that this spring. Uh, it's one of the first things to bloom. Uh, it puts out a fruit really quick, and in early summer, you can pluck off uh, varied size uh, berries. Uh, it's kind of a cross between a blueberry and a pineapple. I've heard some other uh, discussion as to what it tastes like, but that's kind of what it tastes like to me. Uh, I had some entry-level guys that just started with us, our firm, a couple years ago. I got to, got to a job before they were there. I went around back and found this amyl anchor just loaded. So I'm having lunch off of this amyl anchor. And my, these guys that were new to the business, and we were, you know, they were entry-level guys, came around, and they're like, what are you doing? And I said, oh, yeah, should try one. And they thought it was like a hazing thing or something. But anyway, <laughs> uh, they did try it, and I had a hard time getting them to work the rest of the day because they kept nibbling on the tree. So, uh, But it's a great plant. Um, of this, the, uh, the, the two, the Robin Hill and the Ovation, typically are white. Um, uh, that's going to be white bloom, which is pretty typical. Oops, I don't know why that's doing that. Um, the, um, uh, sorry, it, it's, it's uh, jumping around here. I'm not sure what this is going on here. So maybe, oops. Sorry, we might have to start again. Oh, maybe not. It's kind of going on its own. Anyway, hopefully this will stay where it is. Nope. Okay, got a mind of its own. Still yeah. I can't talk that fast to go. <laughs> I'm just telling you. Have you been pushing any buttons? Or? I haven't touched it. Okay. I know better than the tech te touch technology. I always explain to our IT guy, I'm at the level where in my life the most impressive thing is fire in the wheel. So that's, <laughs> that's technology to me. Okay. Okay. So, uh, getting back to amyl anchor, so uh, some people, the, the common names are serviceberry, juneberry, there's a bunch of common names or whatever, but uh, essentially about the only thing that can be challenged with the plant, they really don't like wet feet. Uh, that's about the only thing where you can have a problem with them. Uh, but with these guys, the, the one especially, uh, the standing ovation, um, is incredibly narrow. Um, I've not used it personally, I've seen it, and it's just, you know, a spire uh, going up. Uh, great fall color, um, just a really solid plant uh, going forward. It's gonna be a, kind of a ornamental tree, a small tree, or a large shrub, multi-stem uh, shrub. Um, uh, you can look at it either way, so. Uh, betula, so we get into birch. Uh, thing we ought to have a conversation with first here is the wonderful thing called birch bore and leaf miner. Uh, and any white birch, uh, you're gonna have that as a possibility. Uh, even the white spire that was developed here on campus, um, there was a great, um, not so great story with that actually where the tree, uh, they thought it was true to seed. Uh, they seeded it, some of the seedlings were somewhat pubescent, some were not. Uh, come to find out that some were very resistant, some were not. It got released to the industry and kind of has messed things up ever since then uh, because of that. Um, but generally speaking, uh, like when I have a new staff person, I shouldn't be telling this out loud, but when I have a new designer or something, I say, you know, you're young. And to get people to think that you're professional, you've got to have some, some quick things that you can tell them right off the bat. So if you go in the yard and they have a white paper birch, you put your hand over your eyes and you tell them they have birch bore and you're probably right. That's, that's pretty... <laughs> Pretty straightforward. Uh, anyway, these are a couple of uh, really narrow varieties. The um, park pillar, uh, really seven foot width. That's just crazy. It's just a spike. Um, the uh, senior R, again, it's 25 feet wide, but normally they get wider than that. Uh, and the uh, Fargo there at 10 to 12. Um, beautiful yellow fall color. It, it is a great plant. I've tried other varieties, Himalaya and some other things like that. Uh, we've never, uh, to date, found a great white birch that is not going to be susceptible to bore, uh, unfortunately. Great plant other than that, though. Uh, typically, when we're in this realm with a paper birch, uh, we're going to steer people toward a river birch. And um, unfortunately, there's no columnar uh, river birches yet. And I clarify that yet. Everything that I'm giving you today is stuff that's around and exists. There's a lot of work going on for uh, specific um, characteristics and plant material with the breeders. So believe me, there'll be 
probably 10, 30, 40, 50 more kilometer things in the next couple, three years. So um, it, does, it does go pretty quick. So cherries, uh, again, one of, the, uh, one of the earliest things to bloom, uh, typically a pink uh, of sorts. You got the gold spur uh, that's in the six to nine foot range for width. Uh, not, you know, just a smaller ornamental tree. Um, the only problem we typically have with cherries, because they bloom so early, we have issues possibly potentially with frost damage to the buds where you might, may not get a flower. Uh, because of that, if we get a, a late frost or something like that, it can take them out. Uh, the one, uh, let's see, let me just check my notes here. There was one, the uh, pink flare uh, blooms a little bit later and a little bit less susceptible then to the frost damage uh, and that sort of thing. Um, they also have, you know, it's, it's considered um, a choke cherry, aimer choke cherry. They've got a great uh, bark, kind of an exfoliating bark that's really interesting as the, as the plant gets older. Um, but all these are, you know, fairly narrow uh, as far as that goes. Uh, so we get into crab apples. So uh, when I was young, uh, we used to put in crab apples. There was a crab apple called Hopa. It was a yellow crab apple that the apple was big as an apple. I mean, large, large apple. And back in the 50s, that's what people wanted because they wanted something that was showy and that stayed on the plant. Well, after a while, people kind of got lazy and hated cleaning all that up. Uh, so the breeders said, well, we can, we can make smaller apples, not a problem. They worked on apples, they boom, 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 got it down to where they developed uh, crab apples that had no apples. And we in the north said, well, time out, wait a minute. We want apples, flowers are great, but we only get a couple weeks out of those. We can get six months out of an apple. So we're looking for a small persistent fruit is what we're usually looking for with, with crabs. So in the old days, we'd look for something that uh, you know, the flower was really good, that was the first thing, and then we'd look for a big apple. Well, that's changed, then it was the flower, and then a persistent apple. And then we were like, well, really, we get more out of the apple, so it should be an apple, a persistent apple should be the number one characteristic we look at. Number two is the flower, and then we were like, oops, what about this fungus thing? Uh, years ago, uh, we had a summer where, and this is quite a while ago when I was a kid, we got into July and every crab apple, crab apple in Madison had three leaves on it uh, and we didn't know why. So we went to the experts uh, and they said, oh, perfect storm, it'll never happen again, yada, 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 all this kind of stuff. It's happened every year since then. Um, so again, the breeders got on the wagon and said, well, we'll work on that. So now the number one characteristic we look at uh, is that they're, they're not susceptible to fungus or they have a high resistance to fungus. That's the number one thing. Then that they have a persistent fruits, number two, and flower is a distant third. Uh, typically because it is relatively short-lived. They're very consistent, they're easy to grow. Uh, the, a lot of them have the, the upright form. Um, they, you know, like I say, they have a great flower that develops, starts developing into the crab apple. Crab apples are small, they drop, they're not a, a mess to clean up in the fall and or they last all the way to the following spring on, on a lot of varieties. Uh, so you have that winter interest that you typically don't notice until we have that first snow. So you have a backdrop of white and then it really stands out uh, the color on them. Um, some of these, uh, unfortunately my, my thing is too small and I think my eyes are getting old, but the rest of me is not. Um, so we've got uh, a couple of different ones here. They had ad Adirondack obviously uh, that's the one, uh, I think it's coming up here. Uh, Marley, it's 10 feet wide. We've got Adirondack, that's one of the most narrow ones uh, at a 6 to 8 and a white. Uh, that maypole is just a bizarre little plant. Um, it looks like a maypole. It's really tight and compact, doesn't get very tall. Uh, loaded with fruit uh, to the point where you think it might fall over. Um, just a really, really good plant um, for, a, for a narrow space uh, in that. Uh, they're, um, I wouldn't say any of these are totally resist resistant to fungus because they're not, uh, they're, they're better. Uh, they're not the worst, they're not the best, uh, they're better. They're mostly uh, grown for their form uh, more than anything. They're, they're gonna be nice and tight uh, on that end. Um, next we get into beech. So typically with beech, we're mostly looking at the leaf. Um, they have some pretty interesting leaf colors and things like that. These are some real upright ones. Uh, the dark purple, dark gold, the fasciciated, and the obelisk. Um, the, um, 
predominantly, like I said, it's, it's the leaf. You want to put them in a sheltered location. Uh, they're a little touchy to grow. Uh, or at least get through a winter, you can grow them, but getting them through a few winters can be challenging sometimes. Um, but yeah, so, that, so basically location is going to be one of the one of the biggest things you got to look at when you're looking at some of the beaches that are out there. Uh, so there's gold at 15 feet wide. All these are roughly, um, you know, the, the, the dock there, the dock's purple on the end. They give you a variety or a range of 6 to 15. It, re it really can vary per plant and per site conditions as to the width on it. Uh, so if they've got plenty of room to grow and great soil and whatever, they're going to they're going to spread out a little bit. Uh, and I I think the caveat to any of these columnar growing trees is they will get wider in time if given room and really good soil and everything else. But it's probably way down the road. Not much we got to worry about. They're going to stay pretty tight in columnar for quite some time uh, on the beach. Um, next, we're jumping into ginkgo. This is uh, probably the the fa one of my favorite trees by any any standard. Uh, the, the straight species are going to get quite a bit wider. So this is a columnar form, and I'm using that term loosely in the fact that it only gets 20 to 25 feet wide. But for a ginkgo, that's columnar. Um, the one bummer that I've seen with, with ginkgos, we, we were at a talk uh, with an, an insect guru from the East Coast, this doctor, was talking about diversity. And we were talking at our, our landscape architecture uh, conference about diversity. And he said, uh, so how many people in the room love ginkgos? Everybody raised their hand. Uh, then he started to talk about how, um, how many caterpillars young birds need to eat. Uh, you know, it's tens of thousands. Uh, and the diversity of caterpillars are out there. So unfortunately, with ginkgos, it's got so specific that there's one caterpillar that chews on its leaves, one, period. So as far as uh, diversity, it's a bummer. It's not a good plant, right? You can go to an oak. Just a single oak can have two, 300 different species of caterpillars. That'll be on that oak, uh, sometimes even more so than like an acre of prairie or something of that sort, depending on what's in the prairie. Uh, so as far as diversity goes, it's a real bummer. As far as plants go, it's, it's a phenomenal fall color. It's a great grower. It's got fewer and f well, it's got basically no disease problems, no insect problems. And here's, uh, as an industry, we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot because when we're talking about we want diversity, that's great. Uh, I see diversity as that we just got a huge job of public education out there because we want diversity, that's true. But then when we have a problem with a plant, we go to the, the genetics people and say, hey, we have a problem. This insect's chewing on it, this disease, this whatever. And they're like, okay, well, we'll work that out of the mix, right? So they're working it down to a ginkgo to where there's one caterpillar that chews on it, right? So we've basically reduced diversity down to one, and we're shooting ourselves in the foot. So what we need to do is educate the general public that when you go out and see a leaf that's been chewed on, you've got to go applaud yourself and say, yay, caterpillars are chewing my leaves. This is great for the environment. We don't need chemicals. We don't need anything. Let's just let them run. You know? So that's something that's a long road ahead. Anyway, the, the ginkgo, typically, they have this really interesting fan-shaped leaf. It's almost, um, I mean, it almost glows in the dark. It's so beautiful. Uh, and, and that's what it's really known for, especially with kids. Uh, they'll collect maple leaves and whatever else. And whenever you see them and they pull up that fan-shaped leaf, they just feel like they, got, they found a candy bar. You know, it's a pretty, pretty cool thing uh, when they're doing leaf collection in the fall for a school project or something. Uh, so anyway, ginkgo, one of my favorites there. Hornbeam, another great plant. Um, Carpinus, uh, there's a Fran France Fontaine, uh, the Columnaris, Nana, the Palisade, the Fire, uh, fire Spire, uh, and the Rising Fire. Um, the, uh, uh, there's the, the basically the, the common names Hornbeam. Uh, some of them do have a slight uh, resistance to uh, uh, black walnut, to the juglans. Um, so that, that could be a decent thing. The palisade is one specifically that you cannot have salt anywhere near. Uh, it'll just eat that plant up. Uh, but the rest of them are pretty, pretty resilient uh, and pretty tolerant. And they're so narrow, especially uh, that uh, nana there, the columnar nana, with two, a two to four feet for a width. I mean, it's like a, a light pole. Uh, it's pretty. It's kind of a strange thing, but it's it's interesting. They typically all have a pretty nice uh, fall color uh, in the orange to red. Um, just a, a pretty tough plant overall. 
Um, the uh, next one up, we've got the hackberry. So I've never, uh, hackberry, it's a tough, tough tree. Um, it's used on city plantings and stuff like that because you can abuse the living heck out of it and it doesn't blink. Um, tough plant, this is a variety, uh, the sentinel, obviously only 12 feet wide, again, this really columnar form. Uh, the issues that I've always had with hackberry is they're pretty susceptible to witch's broom, uh, where are these funky uh, mutations in the branches that look pretty strange, uh, and they can run rampant on a tree. Uh, they also have a thing called nipple gall, where they have these little bumps all over the leaves where it looks like it's got acne. Um, that's kind of unsightly. But if, if your plant doesn't, you know, if you're lucky enough that you don't have that problem with your hackberry, uh, God bless you. Um, because I've seen a lot of it and it's not, we put it in areas where that's not going to be a problem and people don't mind that it's got nipple gall or witcher's broom or whatever. This plant will just keep growing. It's tough as nails. You can throw anything at it and it doesn't even blink. Um, honey locust, uh, another fairly tough plant. Again, we're looking at street keeper here. 20 foot is narrow for a, for a, a honey locust. Uh, we planted a lot of Skyline and Shade Master when I was a kid. Uh, it's a great plant other than the fact that they have a really buttress root system where the roots come to the surface and they keep coming to the surface. So whenever we go to somebody's yard and the roots are up, they say, well, what do I do now? Do I mulch it, whatever? Uh, and unfortunately, you get a fair amount of people and they want grass. And it is uh, attainable under a locust because it's filtered shade with such a small leaf. Well, the only thing we can do is add a little bit of soil to cover that, and all we're trying to do is just make it sure that the mower doesn't scar the roots. That's all we're trying to do. It's going to come back. It's going to punch through the, the soil again, continue to come up. Uh, if they don't mind, and we can hopefully convince them into not having grass underneath there, uh, then we can make it into a mulch bed, uh, maybe to the drip line or whatever, uh, and try to minimize some of that screwing around with soil and, and that kind of thing. But uh, tough plant. Uh, the one thing we learned in the industry, uh, I, this was probably... Maybe 10 years ago, uh, we really thought that we weren't going to have any more honey locusts because uh, we ran, the industry ran into a huge problem with canker. What it turned out to be uh, was just a, um, a cultural problem that we had in the industry. So in the industry, we're real busy. You can only dig plants at certain times a year, so on and so forth. So pruning often gets pushed off to the winter, and sometimes that's best. Uh, but in, with honey locusts, that was t the typical thing was we would prune honey locusts in the winter. Uh, come to find out, they said, well, let's just see if we try pruning them in the spring, uh, if that's still going to be an issue. And that's all we had to change, and the canker went away. Because you had that open wound sitting all winter, and it just, the canker just spread all over the place. So culturally, we learn every year about something. I mean, whenever I talk to somebody about a disease or an insect problem or whatever, I usually preface it with, this is this year's X because next year it's always something else, you know. Uh, it's just a, a moving target uh, for us. Uh, but yeah, tough plant, filtered shade, um, uh, pretty good. It will uh, have some die back and, and drop a few branches and stuff, but it's not, uh, not too bad um, as far as being dangerous or, or anything like that. Ironwood, again, tough plant. Uh, autumn treasures, again, we're talking 20 feet is narrow for them. Um, the, um, uh, it's very, very, very urban tolerant, so salt, I mean drought, uh, just about anything you can throw at it, it'll take and, and won't uh, skip a beat. So a uh, tough plant, um, definitely underused. Poplars, so this is the plant that you see like in the parade magazine on Sundays. They say, oh, you want a hedge in a week and a half? We got a plant for you. There you go. Uh, so typically it's going to be some ty type of poplar. Um, they grow like a weed. The, the problem that we have typically as they age, they die back. They're fairly short-lived. Uh, they're uh, fast growers, and you can pretty much assimilate fast growth with weak wood. So you're going to have issues with stuff dropping down, whether it's from wind or dieback or whatever. Uh, but incredibly columnar, uh, almost nauseatingly so. But uh, I, I go out. For some guy must have been out there, uh, like the John, Johnny Appleseed, selling these things because I go out and sometimes I'll see way out in the country on an old farmstead, you'll just see a line of these things on one side that somebody tried to use for a windbreak. Well, the, the, the rub to that is a deciduous tree usually doesn't work real well for a windbreak. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, they got a million of them and they're planted probably, 
you know, they could have gotten by with a third of the plants that they put in because the guy said, well, space them every two feet, when in reality they could have spaced them every five or whatever, that kind of thing. But he sold a lot of plants, so he did his job. Uh, anyway, there's Tower Erectus and the Sentinel here uh, are three of the varieties that are more on, on the columnar side. Uh, the Erecta is the one probably uh, the, the uh, narrowest that's going to be in, in the 10-foot uh, range, uh, close to that uh, tower one. Um, one issue you run into, too, with poplars is they sort of have this cotton that they can diffuse, almost like a cottonwood. Uh, and so they've developed, like, the, uh, the tower is cotton lush. That's one of the characteristics for it. Um, I know the Erecta, that's in town here at a couple places, and it's doing really well uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. Again, with the uh, with the uh, poof and the you know, stuff that's coming off of them, uh, if you go, if, if you can find a male plant, plant, which good luck, they're, uh, they're, the only way you're gonna find them is oh, it doesn't have the the powder to it. So, okay, that's a male. So anyway, when they're younger, there's just about no way to figure out what's a male and a female. If you could, you would. If you could, you want a male, uh, so you don't get that uh, that issue. Uh, so that's a wreck on the left. So that's a wreck on the left there. Uh, just that sentinel weird. was just I mean, weird looking. I mean, just I don't know that I just I don't know that I can plant them close enough to make a hedge on that one. You could do a really nice you could do a really nice alley down the driveway or something. But you don't need nine thousand of them to do any any good at all. Typically, uh, uh, yellow, typically fall color, uh, yellow fall color, uh, and they're they're okay. And they're they're okay. Generally uh, popular. Generally uh, populous. Uh, they're kind of short. Uh, they're kind of uh, short because they grow so fast. Because they grow so fast. I don't really want to use. I don't really want to use a lot of them uh, around here. Around tree lilac. Tree lilac. So, uh, so uh, this plant, a tree you've seen all over Madison, you've seen it all over Madison, and what street terraces and what. The nice thing is it does. The nice thing is then the lilac does extend the lilac to the normal lilac. Send up a central leader. I can't tell you how much time it takes in the nursery to get one of these things to have a straight leader. And it's not so much that it's straight, but it's by itself. Because they'll they send up a leader, and then over here comes another leader. And then up here comes another leader. So they have all these split leaders, which make it incredibly weak wooded. When you look at uh, branching structure, uh, most people go, oh, that's probably a pretty strong angle, something like that, because it doesn't have far to go. That's the weakest angle you can have. The strongest angle is a burrow. 90 degrees like that. So anything where you go back toward narrower and narrower, that's going to be weaker. And these things are, I mean, they do it all the time. We, I had a client uh, not far from here, and I explained to him that. He said, well, take out, take out that second leader and that kind of stuff. I'm like, it's going to look bizarre. It's going to be flat. It's going to take forever for it to fill him. He says, oh, I'm patient. I'm okay. And I said, and it's going to come back. Another one's going to jump in a couple years down. So anyway, we take it off. It just looks like somebody butchered the back side of the tree, but luckily that was the house side. So from the street, it sort of looked fine. Uh, anyway, I went by there a couple years ago, and sure enough, there's a couple more leaders that have come off of that, and he hasn't done anything. And I just, am, I'm not a big fan of lindens, uh, uh, just mostly for that structural reason uh, in that. Maples, so a ton of maples. Um, Fremi, there's uh, one called, uh, 
autumn blaze that's overused. Uh, the problem, uh, what we have is we've got, it's a cross between a silver and a red. So what we have is we have the vigor of the silver and then we have the color of the red. So we did that. Uh, autumn blaze, uh, we don't plant much of it all unless somebody really asks for it and then we have a real co good conversation about frost crack because the, the trunks tend to frost crack on the south side of the plant and, and there's definitely issues because of that. Uh, there's other ones uh, that are full-size trees that work really well, Deborah and, and uh, Brandywine and a couple other ones that don't have that characteristic of the frost split. Um, this one, uh, Armstrong, is uh, a narrow version. We've used it. It's a great tree. It does not seem to be susceptible to frost crack that I've seen at all. Uh, it's got a narrow head on it. Um, we've put it in a couple situations. I had a client who really, for a screen, they wanted this tree. They wanted a major tree close to the house, but they didn't have the room for it. And we had just enough room to squeeze one of these in there, and it gave him the screen he wanted. Uh, without going all over the house and having to be trimmed and butchered all the time to keep it off the house. Um, so uh, right plant, right spot. Um, like I said, it's a cross between a red and a silver. The, the problem that we had, when I was a kid, we planted a lot of red, uh, red maples, Norway maples, silver maples, and sugars. Uh, the problem we had with the reds and the sugars is when you'd, you'd plant them bare root, we'd pull them out of the straw, and you'd, you'd pull out a silver maple, and there's all this fibrous root system, right? And you're like, great, okay. And then my dad would say, well, you'll know when you get to the red maple. So you pull off these silvers or, or even the, the Norways, very rigorous, vigorous root system. And then you pull out this tree, and there's one root going off to the side. That's red maple. That's what they do. They just don't have a good uh, root system. That's why they struggle sometimes, and sometimes we have issues with transplanting them. Um, my one uh, push, I'll say, for professional nurseries uh, is that they actually root prune. So if you, if you think about it, uh, you'll, if you have a tree and it's got this funky root and that's the only root it has, if it's never touched for many, many years and then you go into ball it and you cut that one root, you just cut your neck at that point and that tree's probably not going to survive. So what they do is they come in and they root prune on a regular basis and what that does, wherever they make a cut, now they induce roots to grow and they can get a much better root system uh, because of that. Um, so obviously uh, red maple, red fall color, pretty straightforward. Uh, the biggest thing with a lot of these is the width. Uh, the Armstrong's one, uh, pretty good one in the, in the 15 foot range. Um, there is, uh, I th I'm not sure if I got a picture of it, there's one called sugar cone that's really narrow. But you've got red rocket, that's only 12. Um, and it's really, you know, kind of a short tree at 35 feet. Um, uh, once they get in the ground and they're established, they have a pretty good growth rate, but they're always going to sit a little bit that first year they're transplanted uh, before they take off. But yeah, great varying degrees of red, but you know, red uh, fall color, that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, there was one sugar on the bottom there, it's called sugar cone uh, with a 15 foot width. Um, the, uh, Sugars, and so, so it comes from a native, but because of its cultivated variety, now it's technically not native. They, there's this new thing called native R's, and I won't even go there, but anyway, it's just somebody playing with words. Um, the uh, um, sugars are great, orange fall color typically, um, pretty solid. Uh, if you want some syrup, you know, what, there's a lot of attributes to it, uh, but there are a couple ones in that, um, the one called sugar cone, that was uh, one of the, the most narrow. Uh, and it will even take a little bit of shade, which uh, some of these plants will, especially in the maple family, because they're an understory. Um, oaks. So like I was saying before, with the diversity, I mean, you can't get any better than an oak. Uh, the number of caterpillars that are going to go on the oak species is crazy, absolutely crazy. So if you want diversity in your landscape and in the world and your community, plant an oak. Uh, and we're off and running. Um, so we've got the... Um, this uh, Bonnie May or Bonnie and Mike, it's a uh, it's a variety off of a swamp white oak, uh, only about 15 feet wide. Uh, with the name swamp white, guess what? It it takes water pretty easily, um, so that's that's one uh, nice thing. There are other oaks that won't take uh, uh, wet feet, uh, like pin oaks hate having wet feet, um, so you wouldn't want one of those sitting around. A um, couple things they have developed uh, in that pin oak that. Uh, green pillar, I believe there it is up there, yep. Yeah. Um, there's some issues with chlorosis, which is fairly typical with a pin oak. 
uh, when you're in an alkaline soil, and guess what? We have an alkaline soil. So we have alkaline water that we're watering through alkaline soil. It gets down to alkaline limestone. So it's just we're kind of you can't change their soil to be acidic. You can add stuff here and there, and maybe it helps the plant briefly, but you, you can't physically change your soil to be acidic, not, not around here. Uh, if you want acidic soil, head north. That's the best thing I can tell you. So, um, the, uh, the good thing about oaks, a lot of them are very um, urban intolerant. Uh, they can take a lot of abuse. Uh, they've got great fall color. Some of the issues we run into are um, when they hold their leaves, uh, often uh, oaks will hold their leaves, and you know a lot of people that are very fastidious, uh, they want to get there out there in the fall, get all the leaves collected and everything else, and you look up at the oak and it's dropped a tenth of its leaves, and then two weeks later it drops another tenth, and maybe a month later it drops another tenth, and you're into winter and it's still dropping tree, you know, so uh, that can be uh, annoying to people. Some people think it's interesting and they like the fact that it, you know, in the middle of winter you got this white. Uh, uh, ground cover, uh, and now you've got some of the leaves dropping down and it adds in interest to it. So it just depends on your perspective. Um, so some of them, they're, like there's one called Street Spire, uh, I think it's up on there, yep, that, uh, that's one that does not hold its leaves. It drops them and uh, we kind of move on. So that's, if that's an issue for you, uh, that's maybe one you, you want to go after. Um, that one called Kindred Spirit, that's a kind of a cross between um, uh, an English oak and a swamp. So again, it can take some wet, uh, wet situations. Um, uh, again, fairly, fairly bizarre and narrow. Um, six feet. That's just crazy to have a plant that's only six feet wide that's a shade tree. Not going to get much shade unless you're a telephone pole. But uh, anyway, uh, great plant. Can't say enough about oaks. Uh, we, we need to plant more of them for sure. Uh, and we've got a lot of great ones that we can plant uh, even in the Madison area. Sweet gum, liquid amber. So all I can say with this is good luck. Uh, I've got some people that, uh, a couple clients that have it and it's actually alive. Um, and that's the hardest thing is getting it through our winter. Uh, I'm, I should have qualified at the beginning. I'm old school, so uh, I think Madison's zone four and I will until I die. Uh, when they change to zone five, I just, all I ever ask is did they, have a conversation with the plants about that because uh, I'm pretty sure they didn't that all the zone five plants weren't out there going oh yeah we'll volunteer for four we'll see if we can make it you know knock yourself out uh, anyway we do uh, use a reasonable amount of uh, zone five plant material and I even myself my my wife had picked out this cute little annual it's it's like a uh, corkscrew rush and um, put it in our, our garden I'm like well it's be dead, you know. Now you're not going to see it next year, and surprise, surprise, the next year it came up. So this thing's zone six. Uh, we've had it alive now, and it's not an extremely protected area. It's been alive in our yard now for four years, and every year it comes up. I'm just, what? How? How are you doing that? You know? Can you talk to your other buddies that are zone six because they need some help really bad, really, really bad. So anyway, liquid amber. Uh, like I said. Um, if you're going to plant it, you got to put it in a pretty sheltered, uh, sheltered location. Uh, another one, the tulip tree. So the species itself uh, uh, does really well here. Uh, most of these other cultivars are marginally hardy, um, and they, again, they have the funky form. Um, the, uh, the one called little volunteer. The one thing about that is uh, it'll grow to 12 feet in four years from a whip, so it's very fast growing, very fast growing. Again, if you can keep it alive through the winter, yada, 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 those other things come into play. Uh, but that is uh, uh, definitely one concern with those. So we'll jump to some shrubs. So again, remember, <laughs> narrow is uh, depending on how you're looking at things. Uh, cornus moss is a great plant. One of the first things to bloom in the spring. Beautiful, beautiful yellow blooms. This variety, uh, the pyramidal, uh, pyramidal. Uh, it stays fairly narrow. Again, 10 feet, that's narrow uh, for a cornus moss. Uh, great yellow blooms, that develops into a red fruit. It has a, a little seed inside. Uh, you can uh, eat them ooh, pretty tart, um, but they will be used like for uh, sauces and things like that uh, if you want to. Uh, all I'd say there is good luck, you got to beat the birds. So uh, they typically jump on them pretty fast. But uh, great. You know, it's either considered a large shrub, a small tree, uh, 
that kind of thing, depending on where it is. Typically, it's more considered a shrub than it is a small tree. Uh, but yeah, really, really sour fruit. Uh, and the, like I say, the, the bloom's gonna be coming out usually in March, right along with witch hazel uh, uh, in that range. There was, uh, there was a second one there called Golden Glory, um, uh, another one that just gets a little bit wider, um, and it's got a little variegation to the leaf on that. Uh, elderberry, like the, the native elderberry is a weed. It grows like a weed, it dies like, I mean, it just, it comes up all over, and we're always usually where you don't want it. Uh, anyway, the, um, there's a couple of them that will have this really dark burgundy leaf to them. Um, this one's called Black Tower, six to eight feet, three feet wide, whatever. I've never had really good luck with elderberries. They tend to die back. We've tried them in our nurseries. I can't tell you how many times to where I'm ready to strangle the growers. Um, we've tried them on less water, on more water. We've changed the media we pot them in. We've done everything under the sun, and they do not like to be sitting in a pot in a nursery. They just kind of go downhill. So I can't say it's something I'd highly recommend. It does have this growth habit. If you can grow it, call me, because uh, I'd like to come see it, because <laughs> we're not having much luck with it. Hibiscus or Rosa Sharon. Uh, they've actually trained this now into like a tree form. Uh, great plant. Uh, it'll start blooming in the summer, late summer into the fall, and pretty late. Uh, the one thing you got to watch with this is in the spring, we'll get calls saying, hey, Paul, it's dead. And I'm like, well, the fact that it's April 12th, I'm pretty sure it's not dead. Uh, but there's no signs of buds. This is like one of the last things to pop bud. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to look... Everything else is going to be in full leaf, whatever, and you'll just start to see it popping. So you just got to be aware of that. Uh, there are a lot of different uh, varieties of the broader ones that have different colors and things like that. Again, hardiness uh, can be an issue. Uh, we had, um, I think it was three years ago. I can't remember the exact circumstances of winter, but I would say almost every Rosa Sharon that we had put out there died. And then we went to nurseries to get them. They didn't have any because they all died. We don't, I don't know what the, the factor was. You know, a lot of times it's how we go into winter, if we go into winter dry, if we go into winter wet. I mean, there's a lot of issues like that um, that can wreak havoc with plant material. So, um, but I wouldn't give up on it. It's a great plant. Uh, it blooms when a lot of stuff isn't blooming. And if you have a friend, or for my sake, an office manager whose first name is Sharon, it's awesome. So, uh, lilacs, again, we're looking here. This, uh, this violet uh, uprising, uh, it gets six, uh, six, to four, six feet tall, four feet wide. Again, that's narrow for a lilac. Um, it's got a great bloom, the smell, typical lilac, um, time of year, uh, just a, a great shrub um, going through. But it is, again, you've got to play with the word narrow as to what, what exactly that me means. Um, but it is narrow considering uh, uh, other, uh, other lilacs. It's basically... Uh, in the uh, same venue as a Miss Kim lilac. And again, you gotta be careful with names. Miss Kim, when it was released a long time ago, they said, hey, Miss Kim, we have a dwarf lilac. And I said, oh, wow, that's awesome. And we're using these things, putting them left, right, and they're only supposed to get X tall, five, six feet, was what we were told in the industry. That is wrong. That is totally wrong. They're nine, 10, but nine, 10, that's a dwarf compared to a normal lilac that's gonna get 12 to 14. So. It all depends on your perspective. You know, some of these guys' their perspectives are pretty bizarre, but um, anyway, you gotta compare it to sometimes just the species as to what it's doing. Nine bark. So uh, another one, uh, they came out with one deep, deep burgundy leaf, uh, kind of pubescent. Uh, this is kind of a replacement for purple leaf plum. Uh, purple leaf plum, if you have one, again, uh, keep them and let everything eat the leaves, uh, Japanese beetle and everything else. But anyway, uh, people got frustrated with that, so then we'd, we'd go to Diablo 9 bark. That was the first one we substituted with. Well, it, it didn't have a glossy purple leaf. Uh, it was kind of pubescent. Maybe wasn't, it was, you know, it was good that way. Flower was good, but maybe not as good, you know, something. But we're like, hey, but it's not getting chewed. Life is good, you know? So anyway, then with Diablo, all of a sudden we'd get these, you know, you'd have a huge plant. And again, we didn't realize how big it was going to get. It gets huge. Uh, and then all of a sudden, one spring, you'd wake up, and there's, there's one branch coming out, and it's green as green can be out of the center of the plant. It's just some mutation in the plant. You cut it off. Maybe it'll come back. Maybe it doesn't. Who knows? So then they went through this. You had Diablo. Then they came up with um, 
uh, summer wine, uh, dwarf variety. They've got another one called um, uh, it was a little little bitty guy. Anyway, they got a couple other little ones. Um, they're smaller, fairly narrow. Sometimes uh, powdery mildew can be an issue uh, with some of them, and they can. I mean, I've some, seen some that were pure white uh, from powdery mildew, so that that sometimes can be an issue. But again, in a spot, it can stay fairly uh, fairly narrow. Uh, this particular variety, viburnums. Again, they're going to get big typically. Um, this one only, and I use the word loosely, only gets six feet wide. Some of the issues run into with the viburnum, so we've got a shoot bore. Um, you know, we've got a few other things that are really attacking them, and like with viburnum trilobum, um, I have a really, I love the plant, but I just have a really hard time putting it in somebody's yard just because I'm just about guaranteed you're going to get shoot bore on that thing. Even with the dwarf varieties, Alfredo and a couple others, you're probably going to get the shoot bore, and you won't notice it until all of a sudden you walk out one day, and the branch, there's just going to be one branch, laying on the ground. And you're like, who's the kid that ran through my shrub? What the heck? And then you go over there, and you look at the bottom of the branch, and it looked like somebody takes a drill and just drilled around the bottom from this bore, and it gets so weak, and it just falls over. It'll fall over. It'll still be yellow, uh, uh, green. It's still alive for a while. And then eventually, if you go up to it and grab it, it just pulls right out of the ground. Uh, sometimes they'll go away. There's treatments you can put down, you know, all that kind of stuff. But you know, do you really want to be doing that? So anyway, uh, and there is a lot of work going uh, into plants that might be less susceptible, uh, hopefully resistant to that uh, going forward. Could trilobin, generally speaking, great plant, uh, great fruit, great flower. I mean, just hard, hard, hard to beat. Uh, so anyway, a little narrow one here with the uh, royal garden. Willows. This was one that was brought to my attention by a good friend of mine. So willow, surprise, surprise, it can take wet situations. I know you are all amazed at that and are probably writing that down right now. Um, but basically, it's a corkscrew willow. Uh, it's going to kind of grow in a tuft. Um, it's something that, uh, so it's zone five, so maybe it won't make it through the winter, but we've had really good luck with it uh, with some clients. Uh, and then probably you're just going to mow it down every three years. Just cut it down to the ground, let it come back, and, all, and we're off and running. That's just that's the kind of abuse it can take, and or you can cut it back for stems to decorate and floral displays and, and stuff like that. Um, but uh, pretty tough plant overall. So now this is the uh, the caution slide. Okay, so I got to talk about this a little bit. So we got a few uh, plants that are invasive. Um, so and we could have a three-hour conversation on invasive. I'm really not going to call it invasive. Let's just call it really happy where it is or, you know, those kind. So um, you got to be a little uh, cognizant of that. Uh, but basically in the, the Norways, like when the invasive uh, things kind of came to the state level, we had a lot of people come in and they said, we got to get rid of all maples. And we in the industry are like, whoa, time out, time out. And then they were like, oh, we got to get rid of all of this. You know, and we're like, nope, 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 not all. let's get rid of the word all. Let's go specifically and let's work down the line and let's figure out what has value and what doesn't kind of thing. Um, Generally speaking, normally maples jump all over. Um, uh, not a good plant. Barberry, same thing. Heavy seed producers go everywhere. You find it in the woods a lot. It can take some shade. Helmet pillar, the one thing I'll say about that, uh, very interesting, upright growth. It can take uh, drought. Uh, it's a tough little plant, uh, and it has very few seeds. It's not that it has none, but very few, uh, so at least you're you're helping the, the cause a little bit there with that one. Um, pyrus, the, the uh, pears, again, I'll go on record. I'm not a big fan of pears, not only for this, but there's other reasons with how they grow and stuff like that. Um, we had a project in uh, Middleton for some street trees, and we planted, I think there were evenly, they had to plant 100 trees or something. So we had 33 of these, 33 columnar maples, and 33 um, uh, ivory silk tree lilacs. Uh, every one of these died. Every one. And, it's, and believe me, we planted them exactly they were the way they were supposed to be planted. Every one died. Guess what? They put in another one, uh, something else, the next year. They, they actually had the, the uh, fortitude and wherewithal to change the variety. There's a concept for you. Um, so anyway, uh, not a big fan of those. They, people like them. They bloom really early. Um, but I just, I'm not a real, real big fan of them. 
And then, of course, we've got not only ramnus, but, you know, the buckthorn, but we also have honeysuckle and stuff like that. So you go to any woods in Wisconsin, and that's why you can't walk through the woods, is because of the buckthorn and the honeysuckle and that kind of thing. Um, there is one uh, called fine line. Uh, it's got a cut leaf. Um, it's, there's a little bit of argument in the industry as to whether it seeds or not. If it does, it's almost nil. Um, so if you want an upright plant that's got that cut leaf, I've got one at my place just because I try everything and see what it does before I even recommend it. Uh, right now it's about seven feet tall. It's about this big around. Um, I, I'll be going on record. I was the one that planted a ton of columnar buckthorn when I was a child, so you can all hate me. But um, that was just a plant that was well used back then. When you needed a deciduous plant that was narrow, you couldn't be beat a columnar buckthorn. Unfortunately, in the industry, we didn't realize the uh, seed proliferation from the birds and what it was doing until it was kind of too late. Uh, and that was an easy plant. I mean, I swear, on columnar buckthorn, the only time you'd ever prune a columnar buckthorn is with a chainsaw right at the base. And I tell you, by the end, the end of the year, it'd be back up to five feet tall, and it'd be off and running. So it was a tough plant. Um, not so good to plant, though. Um, so, but anyway, the fine line, if you're going to go that route, uh, it actually... You can still buy a columnar buckthorn in Colorado and a couple other states. It's illegal in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, and a lot of the Midwest states. You can't grow it or buy it or you know that kind of thing. But it's still out there in some places. And that just goes to show you it might be a problem here, but it's not a problem on the East Coast or it's not a problem there because of soil types or other vegetation, ecosystems, whatever, whatever might be the case. But just uh, definitely be careful uh, when you're looking at that. So we'll get into evergreens. Um, boxwood, uh, this one called Green Mountain, we use a fair amount of it for an upright evergreen. Uh, nice and tight, takes very little trimming. You can trim and live in heck out of it, make it look like a giraffe if you want, I don't care, but they, uh, they do take, they're pretty kindly to pruning and, and stuff like that. But they're a pretty easy plant to grow, three feet wide. Uh, I've got one at my house, it's beautiful, it's green. If you put it up to a house, it doesn't die off on the backside like a lot of evergreens do, it'll stay green all the way around. Uh, so it's a good good plant. Uh, Arborvita. Uh, again, we got to go back old school. So on the far left there, pr uh, pyramidal. Uh, pyramidal uh, those are the ones that you see in the uh, um, cemeteries. So you got a headstone and you got this thing that's 30 feet tall and it's split and busted and whatever at the top from snow. And uh, anyway, we just don't use that plant. Haven't used it in 30 years, 40 years. I don't know how long. Anyway. Uh, the, the next one, Occidentalis, uh, typically it's called Emerald Green. Um, we first used that quite a few years ago. We had a batch of about 100 come in uh, and 100 died. And we never did figure out exactly why, if it, was a, if it was a balling issue or what it was. But I was really gun shy to use those after that. We went to the Homestruck. We've had really good luck with Homestruck. Uh, not going to get very wide. The problem with Homestruck is doesn't get very wide. So if you want a screen, we need twice as many plants or three times as many plants to do a screen. Uh, the other thing with Homestruck is it's going to take a while. So people say, oh, I went to a big box store and I got a nice little one gallon Homestruck that's a foot tall, you know, but I want a screen. I'm like, well, you planted it for your grandkids because you're not going to see it. But anyway, you get, so uh, we're just getting now in the industry where, uh, you know, I can get Homestruck that are six, eight feet tall, something like that that we can put in and give you an instant hedge uh, right away. Uh, but in, before, when this first came out, you couldn't do that uh, kind of thing. Um, generally speaking, our provider are pretty low key. The one thing we always get in the spring, we'll get a ton of calls saying, hey, uh, our, our provider is half dead. And I'll say, let me guess which half. It's the middle. I'll take a wild guess that it's brown in the middle. And they go, yeah, how'd you know that, Paul? I say, well, so. Technically speaking, and I won't get into too much botany, but uh, technically, if we really get into it, they're not an evergreen because they have this fawn. It's a leaf. And that, what happens as it grows is it drops about a third of those almost every year, and then it drops heavy when it's transplanted from transplant shock. So whenever we plant any arborvitae, I say, okay, it's looking really good right now, and here's what's going to happen. It's going to thin out, and it's going to be a little bit thin by fall or whatever, but once you get through next year's growing season, it's going to flush back out, and you, you'll never know the difference because once it flushes back out, all the stuff that drops typically is on the inside, and you can't see it. You might see it at the bottom of the plant, but you can't see the brown so much. And really, if you just go in there, grab the stem, you know, I'll go there, and it'll be brown, and people say, oh, my God, Paul, it's some disease. It's, and I'm like, no, and I grab the stem, and I shake it, and it drops out, and I go, there you go. Next. Next question. 
Um, so anyway, it, that's what they're susceptible to. But yeah, just really stay away from the, the pyr pyramidal arborvita. That's kind of an old school plant. Um, the one that gets used fairly often is one called Techni. It's a variety. That actually probably was that first slide I showed you that was trimmed. Um, all I can tell you with that, people say, oh, it's too big or whatever. So I go to people and I say, okay, I can put in 39 home struts and give you a screen, or I can put in five Texies and give you a Techni and give you a screen if you keep it pruned. Uh, Arborvita is the only evergreen where I can, uh, so say, it, say you want it to be maximum height is eight feet and it gets up to 12 feet or something like that. It's the only evergreen where you can go in and surgically remove the central leader and shape that and with one growing season, you'll never know you're there and it doesn't do any detrimental work to the, the plant. Any other evergreens, as soon as you cut out that leader, it will never, and I mean never, grow out of that point. You'll get a side shoot that comes out of the side. And so like if you could really see in a spruce or something and they did that, you'd have the main stem would come up and then there'd be a bud off to the side and it just kind of goes work like this. But on the outside, you'd go, oh, it's a perfect Christmas tree. It looks great. But once you go look on the inside and you see that, that's going to snap off because it's a really weak uh, branch structure. Uh, so it could be problematic uh, down the road. Cypress, again, touchy around here. Um, some people have had luck with them. I really don't go there. I'm, I just like stuff that I don't have to replace. Um, and these, these guys can be uh, a little touchy. Um, so a couple varieties there. If you seriously look at that, th this is uh, more of the uh, fall cypress, the camacypris. So they're going to be in a weeping variety. Uh, we use one. Uh, they're just called golden mops. It's more of a, it's, it's incorrectly used more as a small shrub, but then it takes off and eventually it gets big. Uh, where it will throw out a central leader. These guys typically all have some kind of funky shape, weeping, contorted, or whatever, and either people love them or they hate them. There's no in between uh, on these, so just because of the uh, because of the form. Junipers, uh, so very common to the area. Tough plant, take drought. Um, uh, don't have some of these. Don't have quite as much issue like with snow load and stuff like that, like we had years ago. Uh, on a lot of plants where branches broke off because of snow load. Um, pretty tough plant. Uh, deer typically don't bother them, whereas like arborvita, uh, that's like um, caviar to, to, uh, do, to deer. Uh, normally you'll see uh, uh, arborvita out in the environment and the bottom five feet will be gone. And again, we get calls, hey, the bottom five feet died off. And we go out there and the top's fine. And I'm like, you have deer in your area. And they're like, no, no, I live in the city. I'm like, you have deer. They ate it. That's all I can tell you. Um, so anyway, you can fence them off for a while, and maybe sometimes what we'll do is we'll put deer-friendly plants back in the corner of your lot, and we just say, you know, you're welcome to come here, but if you're going to eat, there's a cafeteria. Just stay back there. And you know, Another thing is if you have a dog, sometimes in and around the house, that can keep them at bay as well, uh, both from the dog chasing them, but also the smell uh, on that. So spruce, again, pretty durable. Um, unfortunately, with that one in the middle there, it's a blue spruce. Uh, we have this disease called rhizospherum. Uh, they don't have testing on this yet. My guess is it's going to get it someday. It might be slower, sooner or later. We don't know. But generally speaking, you don't want to plant any straight blue spruce. Unfortunately, there's still nurseries out there that sell them. It kills me to see that happen because they're just selling you a problem. Here's a great plant. It's going to die soon, so you can come back and buy another. Thank you very much. Come on back. Oh, by the way, it's not under warranty. Thank you. And there's no, no uh, cost-effective way to treat it. Um, and it's, it's really it's a weird disease where, um, like most diseases are top down, bottom up, whatever. They're, they have some polarity to them. With rhizospherum, so there's that dead branch over here on the top, and then there's a dead branch over here on the bottom. Then there's one in the middle. Then there's one here. And it's a really slow process, so it's, it's kind of painful to watch. Anyway, these guys are uh, extremely narrow. Uh, you're going to get some bending a little bit, but they typically have a pretty good uh, central leader that they're, they're pruned to. Um, but really, to have something, especially the one on the left there, that's only going to get two feet wide, that's uh, just outstanding. But usually tough plant, takes, it takes drought situations. Uh, don't want to put them in a wet situation. They'll just rot away. Um, but other than that, uh, really, really, really tough plant. Ewes, some more deer caviar. Uh, they'll chew on ewes like nobody's business. Um, 
Unfortunately, they're normally a fairly slow growth rate uh, out of the nursery and stuff like that. So people wonder why that plant costs what it does. Well, it's a you know, 14 year old plant uh, to get it to that size. We typically have the pyramidal, uh, pyramidal arbor use, uh, you know, when you had a mustache with two evergreens on either end back in the 50s. Uh, they've got this one, the, the columnar one uh, on the cusp of data. Uh, we've used a lot of the Hicksi. The only negative we've seen is if those central leaders aren't strong enough, you'll get a little bit of snow dull that'll push them out. That being said, I've never seen one break, uh, but they'll push them out so it looks like a, a kind of a squash cigar. Typically within a little bit of uh, growth rate, they'll come back together. Uh, they can also be banded uh, to stop them from doing that. But uh, uh, another great plant. We'll get into perennials just quickly. Uh, perennials, generally speaking, we've got the grass families. Um, there's the uh, Carl Forrester grass is probably the one that's used quite a bit now. Uh, the thing you got to be careful with grasses is that they're not rhizominous, so they, they don't send out rhizomes and they don't have a heavy seed production. And that's exactly uh, what the Carl Forrester does not have. It doesn't throw out seeds, doesn't throw out rhizomes, it stays a real nice tight foot to 18 inches in diameter, gets about four to five feet tall, and that's from the ground level up every year. So you, you can leave it up during the winter, cut it down in the spring, let it come up, uh, my one thing that bugs me a lot is I call them turtlenecks. Uh, when people cut them back, they're afraid to cut them to the ground. They leave this much around there so it's brown, and then the green grows up through it. So now I got this beautiful green with this brown turtleneck around there. I, I, I just hate that look. But uh, anyway, uh, I digress per usual. Um, so uh, yeah, the Carl Forrester, uh, um, we've got this, the seagrass, uh, sea oats there uh, up in the upper right hand corner. Um, we've got switchgrass, tough plant, uh, another plant that can take some um, juglins from black, wal black walnut, the panicum. Uh, then we've got the little blue strum, um, extremely drought, uh, that little arrow, I believe we've got there somewhere, maybe not, yeah, there we go. Um, uh, drought uh, resistant as well as, again, you can plant it uh, at the edge of uh, a, a walnut for the juglins and it'll, it'll take that kind of abuse. Um, so we're going to jump into just a few perennials quick, and again, bear with me what's up and straight and narrow sort of thing. Um, we've got, the, we'll start with some of the sun ones, uh, the um, uh, hollyhocks there on the left, uh, basically grows from the ground up. Everybody's like, oh great, and I put it in and it just keeps coming back, it's, you know, it's a perennial. Actually it's the seeds is the only reason it's coming back. If you strip the seeds on that plant, it won't be there next year because the seeds drop down and then it re rejuvenates from uh, seed production. It doesn't rejuvenate from the root. So. Um, but it's an old plant, used to find it around a lot of farms and stuff like that, easy to grow, big blooms, kind of fun to watch as, the, as it uh, starts to bloom and the flowers open up as they go upward. Uh, it's pretty good. Uh, Henry Eilers, again, it's a fairly narrow uh, rudbeckia. Um, it's got a really nice show uh, for, uh, for the flower. Uh, doesn't tend to spread uh, like some of the other stuff did, and it's either, it's either a good thing or a bad thing. Um, does well in, in like a rain garden, um, uh, uh, cut flower. It'll bust through clay, butterflies. I mean, it's got a lot of uh, uh, great attributes uh, for that. So the, um, where are we at? Now we're in the shade. So we've got monkshood here. Uh, again, fairly narrow and a foot and a half wide. There's not many things that only get that wide. Uh, great blue color, uh, cut flower, going to be late summer into fall, you know, as much as deer resent, resistant as anything can be, it is, uh, nothing, I mean, if the deer are pressed, they'll eat anything, I just, and same thing with rabbits, I, I, people have always asked me for lists for deer and lists for rabbits, and it doesn't exist, I'm sorry, no matter what anybody says, if they're, if they're hard pressed enough, they're going to chew anything, we've seen them chew some really bizarre things on hard winters, uh, this winter, they're going to be chewing on some weird stuff as well, uh, just because they got to survive. So, uh, anyway, great, great plant, tough, uh, easy to grow. Um, the uh, bug bean on the left there, uh, there's green leaf, uh, there's the burgundy leaf, very tall stems with these flowers, beautiful flowers, kind of sway in the wind, just really, really nice plant. Um, fills in an area really well. Um, the, uh, uh, well, we got that, let's see, tree. Uh, the ligularia, the, the uh, rocket there, Great plants, sometimes it'll, it looks like a rocket, literally, those blooms sometimes are huge, and they stand up quite a bit. So when they say it only gets two feet tall, that's the, the, um, 
the actual leaves of the plant. The stems can go much higher than that. Uh, and it's kind of a nice backdrop or mix it in with other things where that's blooming uh, in and around there. It, uh, it doesn't like drought. Uh, that'll, uh, that'll shoot it down. It can take heavy shade uh, and it can take uh, wet situations as well. So uh, from there, we're getting into kind of a, an iffy area. We're talking into some things that are, uh, we're going to train. So with pruning, uh, you can do espaliers. Uh, we can do just about anything you want. These are some good examples, apples, pears, ginkgos, beech, linden, uh, Japanese maple. Japanese maple is a bit of a push, but I mean, if you're patient, you can get it there. But really for us, I mean, if, if somebody really wants an espalier, we're going to uh, probably pick a pear uh, because most people, they go, oh, I want an apple. And I'm like, do you really? Do you want to spray it that much? Do you want to spray it every six weeks so you get an apple? Uh, maybe not. So anyway, with pears, pretty easy to grow. Virtually nothing to spray. Diseases, you know, today. That's today. Maybe next year, another problem. But anyway, great thing. Uh, and now they're becoming more and more available. It's not a cheap plant because it took a lot of time to get it there all the pruning and everything else. And typically, we've got to grow it on something, uh, a wall, a structure, whatever, that we'll put up that might be um, you know, H-shaped or whatever. And then we'll train it every year. We'll do some pruning to give a fairly uh, heavy uh, fruit set on each of those uh, shelves, essentially. Pretty easy to harvest the fruit. It's right there in front of you. And it's a vertical, uh, vertical growth garden, uh, as opposed to something that's going to take up a lot of, a lot of room. Uh, trellises and vines and things like that. Um, we do a lot of trellises. The one thing I have to say with a trellis, a trellis is not, and I repeat, a trellis is not a fence. Just so you understand, and if you ever talk to the city, when you're putting up something and it's got to go more than six feet, and it's not more than four to six feet wide, it now has become a trellis. Put a vine at the bottom of it, there's nothing they can do about it, okay? We, we had a gentleman over on Wabisa. He had a crazy client next to him. He needed a screen that was 16 feet tall. We couldn't do a fence, obviously. We tried other things. Didn't work for whatever reason. I came up with an idea. We, had, um, we doubled up panels of lattice. So uh, it, it was 16 feet tall, four feet wide. And then we had one section with two posts. Then we moved back about six inches and over about three feet, put up another two posts. Then we moved forward and over about a foot up. Yeah. So they were offset. They weren't connected, wasn't a fence, and we had a vine at the bottom. The neighbor, because she, who she was who she was, she complained. City came over. They said, she's saying that's a fence. I'm like, you tell me it's a fence. It's three individual pieces, all trellis, lattice work, vines at the bottom, trellis. Next question. And they walked away and said there's nothing they could do. So anyway, you can, you can tweak things a little bit. Hydrangea is beautiful, climbing hydrangea, a little slow out of the gate, but once it gets going, boy, look out. It just takes over. Beautiful white blooms. Clematis, uh, you know, a lot of the purples and different colors and stuff. There's also one that's more in the spring, uh, early summer. There's one in the fall uh, that's more of a white um, that will give you a lot, of, a lot of blooms and fragrance. Trumpet vine, boy, it grows like a weed. Honeysuckle vine. Um, it's a great plant, uh, uh, and it's not a, uh, it's not a honeysuckle that's going to end up in the woods, right? Okay, so I guess i got to wrap things up here. Um, the only other thing I was going to say is there's one annual. You should write this one down, Elegant Feathers. Uh, this thing is amazing. I tried it last year on a fluke. My wife brought it back. It's this cute little evergreen-looking thing. We put it in a pot that was a foot in diameter. We had five of them. Uh, by the end of the year, it was seven feet tall. I repeat, seven feet tall. Uh, it was probably about 18 to 24 inches wide. It was amazing. I mean, you could use it for a screen, for God's sake. And it stayed. We finally cut it off. But uh, I'm actually messing around with it. I pulled it in, one into our garage and one into our basement to see if I can get it to over winter. We'll see. Uh, but anyway, it's a great annual. Great, great annual. So. Uh, and then if you're really ambitious, there's all sorts of other things you can do. Uh, we talk to people about, I mean, can a wood bile be beautiful? Sure. It's narrow. There's all sorts of other things you can stack, rocks. You can make a metal structure filled with rocks. There's all sorts of other ways that you can get at least some kind of screening when you have a minimal space uh, like that. So it really just depends on how, uh, how creative you want to get. So I can take questions afterwards. This is uh, pretty much done uh, for WHA. And uh, if you guys want to hang out, we can do questions here or we'll go out in the hallway. Thanks for coming.